for coming. Um, my name is Wanda, and this is um, Trustus. Today we were going to talk about the rich placement constraint um, to support on YARN. There, there are many people saying that YARN cannot schedule uh, services well, but today we will, we will talk about this. <laughs> we want to change your mind. <laughs> Uh, so this is in trust, and trust us is uh, Apache Hadoop PMC and senior scientist at Microsoft. And I'm Wanda, and I'm also Hadoop PMC at Hotmods. So this is agenda today. Uh, so um, first, we will talk about how we support long-running applications and services on YARN. And we will talk about um, the details of how we do the scheduling with constraints with some evaluation result of the new framework. And finally, we will do a demo. So first, let's go to the support the long-running uh, applications and services on YARN. So um, in the last several years, we see the trend. Many, ap um, many applications are moving from batch to long-running services or applications. Uh, the short-running containers, the short-running jobs like MapReduce, Scope, and Tads, so for this task, because they need the localities um, to handle the HDFS block by block, and that means this, um, this task will run very short, like uh, one minute or so, and massive jobs will be launched at one time and, and handle data and shut down all, all these tasks um, after the finish. This is what we call short running um, containers. This running only four minutes. And for the interactive, um, and, and we, um, for the long running applications, such as interactive um, data um, intensive applications, for example, the Spark and Hive AP, where once the user can do some queries and get a result in many, in many seconds, two seconds. So that means we cannot launch the container on demand. We want the container to be long running and, and get a result when we need it. And similarly, for the streaming, we, we want to make sure the, uh, the data can transfer from one, one node to another node very quick. And for recent, recently, the machine learning uh, from what we see a lot, such as TensorFlow or Spark machine learning, and the Spark ML lib, so for this, they will run for a long time to get the training finished as well. So we did some um, investigations about how the long-running applications in production analytics clusters. So um, here is from Microsoft cluster. We um, checked uh, six Microsoft clusters, and their um, and their workload in percentage of how many workloads are long-running applications. Uh, so we can see from 10 to 100% each cluster's machine are used for long-running applications. And for our side, we also have uh, internal clusters uh, to, um, dedicated to the uh, long-running applications to run the uh, system and services and and the mini young cluster. This also needs to be long running. So this afternoon, Billy and Shane has a talk about the services support on YARN and some advanced topics and our internal use cases as well. So let's compare the two um, type of jobs. One is long running application and one is for the, I call um, batch and classic jobs, which is short running. So for the important piece of the long-running application, of course, it runs longer. And the uptime is very important. We want to make the um, job keep running and do not shut down because of some reason. The, the um, user will not get inter uh, interrupt because of some container um, fail like that. And also, we want to support the in-place upgrade, which um, we don't want the, we lose container. If once we lose container, we have to ask YARN to get the container back, which is not good. We want, when we want to upgrade some binaries for the running service, we want to do the in-place upgrade. And for the service discovery, we want to make sure um, user or the other services can easy to talk uh, this, um, this long-running services. And also for the dependency management, 
uh, because of um, many jobs like machine learning, they have lots of dependencies of the packages they use. How to support better packaging for them is really important. And also we want to make the deployment model to be very flexible. Um, they don't need to write a lot of code to make one and, and so if they want to change some workflow or deploy, deployment of the services, we don't want them to, to write a lot of code or do a lot of work to make that work. We want to support a very flexible deployment models and so they can use. And the last is the placement is very important. So clusters will cover more details, so I will not talk much about this. And for the less important part, uh, the first is the scheduling latency. Because of all the task is long running, we can assume that the task runs from maybe half an hour to, to several days or weeks like that. So, if, um, so in the batch job world, the scheduling latency is really um, um, critical because the job itself runs for maybe 10 seconds or at most one minute. If we take five seconds or 10 seconds to do the scheduling, that will impact the overall performance a lot. But for here, we, um, we can um, do, this, do the scheduling more carefully, more slowly, to make sure everybody plays to the right place. And also for the container, um, launch latency is similar to the scheduling latency. Yeah, so um, that's, why, that's why we introduced YAR service from work, which is available at Apache Hadoop 3.1, and which is also available in the HTTP 3.0 early access bits. So to address these requirements, we, um, so for the first is a dependency management. We introduced um, Docker on Yarn support. It is a very lightweighted mechanism for the packaging and isolation. Um, this is very popular now, and in many cases, um, um, we can replace virtual machines. And for the service discovery, we um, follow the most common solution is using DNS. Because uh, with DNS support, every service has their own um, pre-established DNS entry, so different workers, uh, different um, services can talk to each other without any modification to their um, um, like RPC or some other models. And also we uh, support a very flexible deployment uh, spec, so let's look at the spec. So this is a sample spec of of um, service spec on YAR. Um, so if you look at this, we can see, first we will um, define the name of the service, and we will define the version of the service, which will be um, recorded to see if you have any um, changes of the service spec. You can boost the version, so you can understand where, which version the service is running. And follow that, we can define a list of components. Here, we define only one component. We call TensorFlow Zeppelin. So this is also the spec we used today for the, today's keynote. Um, and we specify a number of containers. Here we only need one a notebook uh, service. And, and then we uh, define the Docker uh, image to use, and uh, what's the launch command, and how many resources we want. For here, we can define the CPU memory and GPUs, um, because in some cases, the application needs and GPU to fast and handle in their workload. And the last is we can define a quick link. And so this will appear on the, um, on the services um, page. User can directly click and go to the TensorFlow Zeppelin UI from YAR. And so they don't need to remember um, all these uh, DNS names. And for the um, service um, and placement policy, we also support to have this, to tell the yarn how to placement uh, the service. For example, here we uh, start an engine server, and we told the yarn to do the anti-affinity, which means place one task um, on one node, do not um, more than one on, on each node. And we can specify the, um, what's the node attribute we want, and what's the, um, for example, what's the operation system we want, and what's the fault domain we want, and what's the load, par load partition we want, and for example. 
So for the load attribute, this is coming after Hadoop 3.0. Uh, this is in progress work, and um, is um, I think most of the features works end to end. Yeah, so that is my part. I will hand over to Kostas to talk about more details of this strategy. Oh. So this is it's working. I'm good. Uh, cool. So I want to talk to you so far about all the additions that were uh, done in uh, Hadoop 3.1 in order to support services in terms of how do we specify, how do we deploy, how do we upgrade them. Now uh, I'm going to be talking about how do we properly place those uh, long-running applications in our clusters. So just to give you an idea of what is the, the big problem we are uh, going to, to solve, um, so let's uh, consider this uh, toy example, a uh, toy cluster. So we have uh, eight machines. Uh, they are organized in two racks. And uh, we also have, um, typically in our clusters, for example, at Microsoft, we have what we call upgrade domains, which are logical node groups of nodes that get upgraded at the same time. Um, and uh, we have eight nodes. And let's say we have some MapReduce applications that are running in the cluster. And at the same time, we have uh, we, we want to deploy some edge-based containers, so we have these two containers. And on top of that, we also want to add Storm. So what are our objectives, what we care about? As a user, what I care about is performance, right? So for that, maybe what I want to do is to place, to, to tell Yarn to place Storm containers on the same rack as edge-based because my Storm containers are reading from edge-based, so I want this to be done fast without much network traffic. Uh, at the same time, I care about resilience. So I know that my cluster has these upgrade domains. If, they, if I place all my edge-based containers on the same upgrade domain, it means that I might lose all my containers at once. So instead, I want to spread them across upgrade domains. And as a cluster operator, what I care about is, for example, I want to reduce the resource fragmentation so that I improve the utilization of my cluster. Or maybe I'm in a cloud, a cloud setup, so I want to minimize the number of machines that are used for my uh, for my applications. Um, and if you notice the common uh, theme in all these three objectives, like the performance, resilience, and the cluster objectives, is that it is all about placement with constraints. I will be talking a bit later about how, we, how much we can improve performance by using constraints, but let me double click a bit on the, on the resilience part. So we looked at the Microsoft, uh, at one of the big clusters at Microsoft. This is a cluster with tens of thousands of machines. And uh, I plot the unavailability of uh, the, the percentage of machines that are unavailable for uh, these four days. And as you can see, in total, we have less than 10% nodes at each moment in time that are down. This is not only failures, right? It can be software upgrades, etc. At the same time, as I said, our clusters are organized in node groups. So these upgrade domains that I'm saying. So if I look at specific upgrade domains, I can see that, for example, for this upgrade domain, although the overall cluster unavailability is less than 10%, there are moments that the whole upgrade domain is down, so up to 100%. So this means that if I deploy my LRAs randomly, I might deploy all of them on the same upgrade domain, and I will lose many containers. Uh, now let's look a bit at what are the existing solutions to do better placement with constraints. So, the simpler thing you can do is random placement, in, the, in which case you can have high quality placement only if you are extremely lucky. So if you happen to, to have your containers where you want, it, where you want them. Uh, a bit better than that, uh, typically what you can do is you can specify target nodes. So instead, uh, you cannot say place all my containers at the same rack, but you can say, for example, place both these two containers on a specific node. In this case, you can get some, some type of affinity, for example. Um, a little better than that is you can do static machine attributes. So you know, for example, that you have GPUs in these machines and you want to place your containers on these specific machines. And more lately, uh, what uh, some other schedulers, for example, what Kubernetes has done, it has added support for affinity and anti-affinity across containers, but they do the placement in a way that leads to many constraint violations. So as we will show later, they cannot really uh, do, do very high quality placements. Uh, so just to give you an idea of what are the type of constraints we support now in Hadoop 3.1, you can do stuff like uh, affinity. So you can say place uh, my storm containers on the same rack as another, as another edge-based container. Uh, you can do anti-affinity. So you can say place five storm containers in different nodes from nodes that are running Spark uh, so that there is less interference. 
you can say even more uh, involved constraints of the form uh, of what we call cardinality. So you can say place seven storm containers, uh, but don't like put them in a way that you don't have more than five of these containers per node. And you can also compose constraints. For example, you can have composite constraints of the form place five co spark containers at different nodes and don't place any of them on the same rack with an eight base or place them on the same rack with eight base. So these are some of the constraints that are currently available in the latest version of Hadoop. Uh, now let's see what were the challenges that we faced in achieving this. So first of all, what we want to do is we want to be able to refer to groups of containers. So for example, my eight base containers. And we also want to have groups of nodes that we can refer to, like the upgrade domains, the rack, anything. Uh, the second challenge is, um, and by the way, for, for that, we, what we did is we have added the container tags and node groups, as I will explain. Uh, the second is we want to be able to express, like the, uh, to allow the application to express um, con involved constraints. And for that, I will show you what the, uh, our API looks like for expressive constraints. And then the third one is how can we achieve, uh, achieve in the scheduler very high quality placement without affecting the task-based jobs. And for that, we introduce a module that we call Placement Constraint Processor. Uh, so let's uh, double click on, this, uh, on each of these three features. So what are container tags? The idea is that we want to use tags to refer to groups of containers. As you can see here, we have two nodes. The one is running a storm container, the other is running an edge based container. What we can do is, for example, take uh, the edge based container, we can add some tags to it where, at the moment we are submitting it. So we can say that this is, we can specify the application type. So this is, for example, a key value store because it's edge based. We can also specify the role of the, appli of the application. So this is an edge based master container. Further, we can, specify the, we can specify the resource specification. So this is a memory critical container. And at the end, we can also say that this is a container that belongs to application with this ID. The good thing about being able to specify these tags of containers, you know, so far you could specify tags like attributes to nodes. Now we can do tags to containers. And this means that, for example, when I say this key value, I can refer to, to containers that belong either to this LRA or to any LRA in the future. So that's the first construct we are using, and you will see how we use this in the constraints. And the second is the node groups. So you know the notion of node and rack. Now what we did is we can have logical node groups to refer to dynamic nodes, node sets. So for example, here we have again the two, the two nodes from before. And for example, we know that these belong to the same upgrade domain. So examples of node groups are node, rack, upgrade domain, and others. Uh, what we do is we associate nodes with all the container tags of the containers that are at the moment running in this, uh, in this uh, node group. So for example, in the node tags, we have in the first one, we have in the node and one, we have storm, Nimbus, application ID two, and in the other, we have all the tags of the edge-based container. Now, if we look at the upgrade domain, the upgrade domain inherits all the tags of these two nodes. So now the upgrade domain tags are all this, is the union of the two. And, uh, what is cool about this is that we can have constraints of the form spread my age based master containers across upgrade domains. So the, the user doesn't need to know what are the racks, what are the upgrade domains. He just says, I don't care how the cluster is, I just want to be across upgrade domains. Uh, and now let's see how we define constraints in the latest version of YARN. So we have introduced the placement constraints API. We have static methods for LRAs to specify constraints. And um, here are some examples. So like I said, we can have affinity. Uh, and this would look like we have placed three storm containers in the same rack with H base. We can have anti-affinity, which says place five storm containers not in the same node with Spark. And you can have cardinality where you say place seven storm containers on a node that has from zero to five, so no more than five storm containers. So this way you can put a cap on the number of storm containers per, per node. Uh, we can do even more involved stuff. For example, we can have both uh, constraints within a single application or across applications. So here the first one, we say this is across applications. So you want to put three Zookeeper containers not in the same node with Zookeeper containers coming from other applications. That's the node self. Or you can say, I don't care from which application they're coming, which is the all tag that we have there. Uh, we can also have composite constraints. So like I said, we can have end or. So there you, essentially, you, you want to say, I place five Zookeeper containers. 
and they have two constraints. They have to be on the same rack with HBase, and they have to be not on the same node with ZooKeeper. And finally, we can have constraints at different levels. So we can have a constraint for a single container, we can have constraints for the whole application, or we can have constraints across the whole cluster. So the operator can say, I don't care from which application you're coming, but don't put more than three Spark containers per node, let's say. Um, having defined the constraints, now let's move to how we do the scheduling. So the main idea here is that we have introduced the placement constraint processor to be able to satisfy complex uh, constraints for, uh, for applications. So the idea is that this is how Yarn looked so far in the 2.x version. So you have your capacitor, your first scheduler, you have the cluster state. So this remains like it is. And now what we added is we added this uh, new module for the LRA. So we have the LRA interface for defining the constraints. We have the newly added uh, placement constraint processor that actually decides the placement. And then we have the constraint manager that stores all this con this, the tags and the constraints in the node groups. Um, so how does placement happen? So the task based, the existing like map reduce and anything, the task based allocations happen like traditionally from the fair or the capacity scheduler, while the high quality placement for the LRA constraints happens with the new mo in the new model. So let's say you first have these two tasks in red that you want to place. These are, have no constraints, have nothing to do with the new stuff. So you will simply go directly from, through the capacity or the first scheduler and place them directly in the cluster one by one. Now, when you have an LRA, it has three containers. Now, you want, when you're doing the placement, you go first. You see that they have constraints, so you go first through the placement constraint processor, and you look at all of them at once so that you can satisfy their constraints better. And then you go again through the capacity scheduler to do the actual placement. And then you do it, you, you go to the, uh, to the cluster to run. Um, so, this way we can satisfy constraints without affecting the performance, uh, the low latency of the existing task-based jobs. And um, some, uh, a, a few details about the implementation. So this, as I said, is part of Apache Hadoop uh, 3.1. Uh, if you want to follow all the open source effort, this is in the following tier of the YARN uh, 6592. Um, the main additions were the constraints API and a few modules that we added in the schedule, the RM, which is the tag manager, the constraint manager, and the placement constraint processor. And uh, this is a very community effort, so it's uh, me and Wag that I did a lot of work, but also there are many more folks. So it's Arun uh, from Microsoft, Weiwei from Alibaba, Panayotis from Imperial College, Sunil from Hortworks, and many, many more that were involved. Uh, in uh, discussions uh, the last couple of years. Um, and um, I will uh, present a couple of experiments to show, like, I want to answer actually two questions. The first one, do we really, you might be thinking, okay, we already had kind of affinity and affinity one way or another. Do we really need these more complex constraints? That will be the first one. And the second is, what can we achieve in terms of performance in uh, Hadoop 3.1 for these services? Uh, so the first one, what we did is we took a TensorFlow application with 32 workers and uh, we tried to see how it, its performance get affected if we constrain the number of workers that run per node. So on one part of the spectrum, you had just one worker per node. This is what anti-affinity will give you. And on the other hand, you have full affinity. So you put all your 32 workers on a single machine. We ran two experiments. The first one was on a low utilized cluster. And what we saw here is already that affinity and anti-affinity is not, is not the ideal. So usually, like, what you would want to do is to do four, four workers per node. Uh, so in a sense, c cardinality constraints are important here. But even more important, when we go to a highly utilized cluster, like here we have some MapReduce jobs and we run on top of them uh, the, uh, the TensorFlow workers, we can see that performance can vary dramatically. And for sure, the affinity and anti-affinity are not enough. So you can see here, for example, that compared to anti-affinity, the ideal, which is 16 workers per node, is we, we are 34% better. And compared to affinity, we are 42% better. So it is really important to be able to specify uh, more, uh, more complex constraints. Um, and um, a second, so 
we, we saw the importance of having cardinality constraints. Now, uh, we did a larger scale uh, deployment. So here we have a pre-production cluster with 400 machines uh, and uh, 10 racks. Uh, we uh, deployed various uh, long-running applications. So we have 50 age-based instances, 45 TensorFlow instances, and we have 50% of the cluster being used by batch, batch jobs. And we have a few constraints. And uh, I want to, uh, I will show you what happens to the, uh, to the TensorFlow performance by, in this cluster uh, by doing the deployment with various uh, different approaches. So, um, first of all, we have the no constraints. This is what Yarn would give you. This is, uh, that would be the random placement that Yarn would give you in, uh, in all the Hadoop 2.x releases. Uh, and by the way, each box plot, I, I, I plot the median, and then I have in the box the 25th and the 75th percentile, and the whiskers is the 5th uh, the fi uh, the fi uh, the and the 99th percentile. So we have no constraints, this is what you get. Then you have what we implemented, the algorithm of uh, what Kubernetes will give you, which is uh, just uh, you could do affinity. So that's the Kubernetes performance, so it's already quite better than Yarn, the, or the older versions of Yarn. Uh, then we extended the Kubernetes algorithm by also, uh, and, and what you can, uh, you can see already that with Affinity we have 58% per better median uh, performance, runtime. Uh, then we extended Kubernetes to also add cardinality constraints, and uh, as you can see here, in some cases that the cardinality constraints were met, but the problem is that Kubernetes do does just one container at a time, so it cannot always satisfy the constraints. So in some cases that it satisfied the constraints, you get good performance, like you see the 25th percentile. But in other cases, the performance is bad, right? So it's even worse than what it was with Affinity, just because it cannot do uh, constraints as well. And then here is what we can do with Yarn. This is the 3.1, the, the current version. And here you can see that we can do both cardinality and, and do multiple containers at once. And this leads to many less constraint violations. And as you can see, we can drop, for example, the 99th percentile by another 54% compared to what the improved version of Kubernetes, Kubernetes could do. Uh, so we have a significant performance and predictability improvement in uh, Hadoop 3.1. Uh, how can you try this out? Uh, so you just need to set one parameter in the yarn conf. This is the parameter. Uh, and the applications have to use the new placement constraints API to specify their constraints. And that's one that we'll show you in the demo now. Uh, in the services configuration, we can also very easily um, sat, uh, specify the constraints that we want. And uh, more, uh, you, can, uh, you can, in this link, you can follow uh, to see the full documentation. We have a lot of examples about how you can specify constraints. And to wrap up, so we have important additions in Hadoop 3.1 for long-running applications and services. What Wang to talked about was uh, deployment, packaging, upgrade, discovery of LRAs, and I talked about the scheduling of LRAs. So we have expressive constraints, and we have high-quality placements with a new constraint processor. And uh, there are many more things to be done, so come help us. Demo time. So you don't need to say. Yeah, so thanks, Kastas. Uh, let me do some quick demo for this. Seems not the same screen. Okay. All right. So first, let me connect to the VPN to our cluster. So I'm going to submit this um, spec to Yarn um, by using non running um, by using Yarn service framework. Um, so let me just go to the new UI framework and go to the services. So as you can see that we already have some running services here, uh, such as distributed TensorFlow and some Zeppelin notebook and some HBase service and some other services here. So by clicking the new service, we can very easy to deploy the, the services here. Uh, we can put our JSON spec to here, and we can maybe change the name to 456. And what's the version here, and what's, so for this um, application, I'm going to demo the anti-affinity feature, um, which the service 
and can deploy the containers in anti-affinity pattern. So this is the name of the component, and this is how many containers we want. And this is the command we, um, for each, each launched um, service will run. It is just a long sleep job. And resource we, for each service task. And here is a placement policy. We, we tell Yarn that this is uh, anti-affinity placement. And the scope is node, means on every node, it will do anti-affinity. So that means on each node, it can run at most one container. And the target test is sleeper means it will anti-affinity to itself because its own name is sleeper here. All right, so let me um, put my name and we, and we can deploy the service. So let's go to, um, go to services page and refresh. You can see that the, the sleeper service is already started. We can go in to see the resource usage. And you can see that on every node, so on the on one node we have two containers, and on the other node we have only one container. So why this has two containers? Because it has runs application master. Uh, application master is not counted to do the um, anti-affinity. We only do the anti-affinity to its launched containers. Um, yeah, so I think that's for my demo. <laughs> Very simple. <laughs> so any questions? Cool. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, so the question was if the uh, if the user specifies the wrong constraints, or was it if it specifies too many constraints and they cannot be satisfied, or both? Both. Yeah. So at the moment, indeed, like it's a you know a great strength, great responsibility kind of thing, right? So yes, you can specify any constraints you want, and if you specify the wrong constraints. Uh, it might be like like we saw, right? It, it can lead to worse performance. So I would say that of them. I mean, ideally, you would want a way to derive constraints automatically. But at the moment, I, I would say that it's more like trial and error. Like you you specify some constraints, you see how your application is looking like, because it really depends also on your cluster, right? So how your machines are, how your network is. So it's not that simple to say, okay, for any TensorFlow, this is the ideal. You so even for the expected cluster utilization, it might change how many constraint, how many workers you might want per node. So at the moment, yes, it has to be done by someone that has some domain knowledge. Uh, so uh, does this answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, please go. In those experiments, they did, yes. Okay. yes. Um, so you, you mean the edge-based application is running on Yarn? Yeah, yeah. So, so basically, yeah. when the user wants to launch the services, they can specify um, a single service, or it wants to run with some other services. For example, if they want to run the edge base with a Zookeeper or Ranger, they can do that. They can just need to specify this in the spec file, and so Yarn will do the orchestrations. Uh, that would be, uh, that is more, uh, like there is the reservation system that would do that, like uh, that would be the right way to, so in the reservation system you, there is this RDL language that you can say, I want to reserve some containers at this exact time uh, every day, for example. So the reservation system is part of Yarn? 
is part of Yarn, yes, since uh, 2.6, I think? 7, 7. Yeah, so, so you can do that, but that would not have to do. What, what is still we would like to do is that if we can do the reservation with constraints. So at the moment, uh, you cannot have both reservations and constraints. So you can do constraints like, okay, at, I submit my application now and there are these constraints. You can do reservations, but not the two together. So one possible direction would be like, we would like at some point to have, uh, to be able to say, yes, run it that time with these constraints. And that would be actually, because these are typically very often recurring jobs, it would be very useful to, to have that feature as well, yeah, indeed. Yeah, so basically the DNS entry is, uh, we have a, a Yarn DNS server um, launched, and for every task, we will generate a DNS entry if they specify, if they want that. And between the tasks, they can use the DNS name to communicate, same as, uh, um, same as a normal um, network communication. And also, the, an outside can also can, can, it, uh, can communicate with um, tasks running inside the cluster. Yeah, yeah, so you only need Yarn to support the DNS. So, any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, do you see a case for sort of co-locating or like co-location of services and like service groups or any faster placement of entities, kind of like pods for improving this? So, so you mean more like um, whether we have right uh, so I mean the most simple use cases are within an application so to be able to specify it for sure but uh, then for example if you have services that cooperate right so for example you have like we said storm and it's reading from age base they are for sure at least at the same rack would be useful or we have we, we have like at Microsoft, for example, we have many different, uh, like a key value store that wants to talk with uh, the streaming engine or something. So in those cases, it is important to, uh, to collocate across. Yeah, so, so basically you can, um, you can do that. So if you want to run the storm service close to the HBase service, you can specify the uh, inter-application or inter-service placement constraint. That, that, uh, is this what you mean, or? Okay. Okay, let's take it. So, any other questions? Other questions? Yeah, Yeah, so we are at the of this. <laughs> In <the> inception? <laughs> so the question is, can we run YARN on top of YARN? Yeah, we are very good at this. <laughs> Internally, we have, uh, so I think in the last year, um, Billy and Shane sitting in the back, they have um, a session about running YARN cluster on YARN. And we do this every day for um, hundreds of times and make the cluster to, to run. <laughs> All right, I think like that's all. Okay. Oh, yeah, so please go ahead. Uh, last, one last question. So what happens if you do specify constraints that cannot be done? So at the moment, like the, the version that is open source, the constraints are hard. So that would just mean that uh, you get back that it was not successful. Uh, but eventually, you know, and then you can retry. Um, another way to do that would be like uh, we had some prototype that you just do soft constraints. So essentially you try your best. If you cannot do it, you just place it. But at the moment, to keep it simple, in the open source version, it's just hard constraints, yeah. Uh, but then you can, you know, like repeat. Uh, so we keep the, the failed, let's say, scheduling requests, and then we can resubmit them until they... Yep. Uh, there was one more. 
I think that's all. Right. We're good? It's already 12.30. Okay. Yeah, thank you.